just outside of the law library. I have some time. I have to do a deposition prep around 2.30, but we'll see if we can get through some of this. Uh, in response to my Nasty Nathaniel video, Mud Wheeling took great umbrage, saying that I was um, making misleading statements of law. I believe that he is mistaken because he eventually clarified that the misleading statements of law that I made were at about the five minute mark. So, I don't think at four minutes and nine seconds I said that th here is my practical solution for you, referring to Nasty and Nathaniel, referring to the situation that he was in at that time. And at eight minutes I said that was just some practical advice. You can go watch the video yourself. So, but anyway, he did give me, uh, Mud Whelan did give me some cases to look at that he thinks are going to disprove me. Now remember also my California citizens arrest case is directly related to this. So again, we're going to uh, proceed with those in mind. The first case he gave me was Johnson v. Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, there is a link to it online. You can find it for yourself. Uh, in Johnson v. Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, there was a angry person who was drunk and trying to exit a parking structure out of the entrance. He broke the, he got out of his vehicle and broke the uh, little army swingy up or downer thingy. That's the technical term for it, in case you didn't know, is the army swingy up or downer thingy. Uh, and then the uh, security guard got in the way between him and leaving, and he got back in his car and drove into the security guard. Apparently didn't hurt him, but still can't do that. Uh, police officer arrived. Uh, the police officer obviously didn't see these things coming to pass, but it was a drunk driving case and there was property damage, apparent property damage, and he had driven his vehicle into somebody, all of which are fairly substantial and serious kinds of things. And there is a difference between a chance medley, which happens to result in some minor property damage, and somebody driving drunk slash driving their vehicle into a pedestrian slash breaking, destroying property. There's a difference. So the officer exercised her discretion and arrested him. Congratulations! I already said that officers can arrest people. It is their discretion. People, and I don't really see that this case is terribly interesting in any other way. Um, I don't know why he cited it for me, but great. Uh, his best two cases are at the end, so we're kind of working up. Next one is People v. People v. Johnson. There is the link. Uh, People v. Johnson, uh, there was a phone call out to the police. Uh, somebody was arrested for six counts of burglary, one count of attempted burglary, and two counts of possession of stolen property. Uh, the officers on the way to the call saw somebody and stopped him, so the man was already detained. Uh, the victim, or the guy who made the call, said, you just passed the suspect, he's over there. And so they decided to arrest him. Now, bear in mind, on, on, they brought they brought the witness or the victim or the complainant out to identify him and make the citizens arrest. And that's fine. That's their discretion. It was their discretion to detain the man in the first place. It's their discretion to arrest the man. It's exactly as I said, but you'll notice that there are six counts of burglary, one count of attempted burglary, and two counts of possession of stolen property. Again, it is ever so slightly distinguishable from a simple battery. Then you have Green v. Department of Motor Vehicles. In Green v. Department of Motor Vehicles, somebody saw a person driving drunk. They followed him. The person pulled into a private driveway, parked, passed out. They called the police. The police re responded. The police went to the address. They found the person in the vehicle. Again, this is drunk driving. I think there was actually yeah, he actually hit a center divider. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So they got him for drunk driving. Again, that's up to the officer discretion. Again, it's slightly more, um, it's, a, it's a slightly more dangerous crime, has higher consequences. Um, and it's unlike battery, simple battery, uh, there's never a question of who started it. It doesn't matter. Things like that don't matter. 
who started it? Was the person just defending themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's People v. Kelly. People v. Kelly. I have no idea why this case was given to me, but whatever. There's not even a citizen's arrest in this case. Cops respond to the call of somebody who's passed out, I believe. Um, they found him too guilty. Uh, he's passed out in the car. He'd been drinking too much. Um, they told him to get out of the car. Uh, they, so he got out of the car. They were going to frisk him. He's like, you ain't taking me to jail. And he knuckled up on him and etc. cetera. Uh, so they found him guilty of two counts of the offensive battery against the peace officers and the performance of their duties. The police were there from the get-go. Uh, I don't know why he gave this to me. Maybe it's because somebody called in that there was a person passed out in the street. I don't know. It's not really a citizen's arrest case. Then there's Padilla v. v Mies. This is one of the two that are crunchy. In Padilla v. Mies, Padilla was driving through an agricultural inspection point. Mitch Miller is an inspector for the Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, he noticed that Mr. Padilla was drunker than a skunk. I don't want to sound offensive to skunks. I'm not, I'm not saying that skunks drink a lot, but whatever. He was still, he was still drunker than a skunk because skunks don't drink. Um, so, so Mr. Miller informed the plaintiff that he'd been drinking too much and told him to pull over and park. Plaintiff complied, plaintiff being Mr. Bedia. Mr. Bedia was a person who ended up getting arrested for drunk driving. Officer responded, um, ended up arresting him. Again, there was plenty of evidence that uh, Mr. Padilla had been driving drunk. He was alone and behind the wheel of the truck with the engine running at, a, at an isolated location. Taken together with Miller's report, the officer had reasonable belief that the plaintiff had driven in his intoxicated condition. Again, it came down to it's a much more serious offense. And the officer exercised the officer's discretion. This is the meaty one. This is the one that kind of breaks it down. It is a uh, federal case. It's a 1983 lawsuit. It's a 1983 lawsuit. And in this 1983 lawsuit, uh, the police were responding to a call for um, a fight. People were having, they were brawling. Uh, there was somebody who was attempting to do a repossession. The person whose car was getting repossessed uh, did not appreciate that and attempted to stop him. They ended up scuffling. Uh, at the end of the day, Officer O'Keefe and six other unnamed officers uh, appeared shortly and separated Bruno, who is the repossession officer, from the plaintiffs who were suing the officers on the 1983 lawsuit on the theory that uh, these officers were helping Bruno um, repossess the vehicle. So this, this paragraph right here is pretty interesting. Um, I just want to point out in this part that uh, Bruno wanted to effect a citizen's arrest against plaintiffs for assaulting him, and plaintiffs informed the officers that they too wished to effect a citizen's arrest against Bruno for assault and trespass. Officer O'Keefe satisfied herself that Bruno had been authorized to repossess the vehicle and asked Bruno something to the effect of, is there any way we can resolve the situation peacefully? Bruno stated he would not press charges if plaintiffs would let him take the vehicle away. According to the complaint, Officer O'Keefe went to the plaintiffs and told them, it looks like this is what we are going to do here. Either you are going to let Bruno take the car or we're going to arrest you. That is the officer exercising the officer's discretion plaintiffs alleged that they were incredulous and insisted on speaking to a police sergeant. Officer Dowden was summoned. After being apprised of the situation, Dowden related to the plaintiffs that giving the car to Bruno was their only option to avoid arrest. Plaintiffs, feeling they had no choice, agreed to let Bruno take the car. So the officers, again, as I stated, can, in, in this case, in this case, uh, Bruno had not been taken into custody by the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs had not been taken into custody by Bruno. The officers exercised, exercised their discretion to effectuate a citizen's arrest, and they got to pick which citizen's arrest they wanted to effectuate. And the breakdown is right here. A private person has, who's been arrested, a private person who has arrested another for the commission of a public offense must, without unnecessary delay, deliver him or her to a peace officer. That did not happen in this case, but all right. Uh, a private person making a citizen of arrest need not physically take the suspect into custody, but may delegate that responsibility to an officer, and the act of arrest may be implied from the citizen's act of summoning an officer, reporting the offense, and pointing out the suspect. They can delegate it. We've already established that. 
California law gives the officer the choice. Oh, wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, what? California law gives the officer the choice of making the citizen's arrest or not. But there are powerful incentives to make the arrest. On the one hand, the officer who makes an arrest pursuant to a citizen's complaint is not subject to liability for false arrest or false imprisonment. On the other hand, an officer doesn't have to make the arrest if he or she is satisfied there are insufficient grounds for making a criminal complaint. So again, I don't know entirely what we're arguing about at this point. Um, the very cases that you gave me summarized effectively the legal analysis I gave on making a citizen's arrest. And it in no way invalidates the statements I made in the giving my practical advice to Nasty Nathaniel. So, and remember, I was giving him the practical advice between 409 of the Nasty Nathaniel video and eight minutes. If you can't deduce that I was giving practical advice, you may wish to tune in to me actually saying that I'm giving you practical advice. So anyway, um, thanks for watching. I, I do want to express to uh, Mud Whelan that uh, there is no hard feelings. Um, you're more than welcome to continue arguing. I, I don't know exactly what we would be arguing about at this point. Um, I definitely appreciate you giving me cases. I love cases. I love people swinging more at me than just their dick. If you have some cases in your hands, I appreciate that. Uh, speaking of swinging dick at me and Nathaniel, uh, just so you know, am I, am I pretty enough for you today? We've got a tie. We've got a lovely tie. The gray shirt. Oh, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I can't wait to hear about how I screwed up my attire. What is that? on my pants um i can't wait to hear how i screwed up my tire yep and socks and shoes and the shoes they match the belt can you see the belt there you go it's important all right thanks for watching have a great day